But the very worst effect of multiculturalism is what it's done to the idea of truth and lies. It has simply exiled truth and replaced it by lies by reversing the notion of who is a victim and who is a victimizer. It goes like this, as you probably know, minority rights is a phenomenon in America too. If you are a minority, racial, sexual, religious, uh, uh, ethnic, whatever, uh, you are deemed to be a victim of the majority. This actually doesn't apply to Jews who are not considered a minority at all because as we all know they run America, but put that to one side. If you're any other kind of minority, if you, if you do something terrible, we can all agree the deed is terrible, suicide bombing is terrible, we can all broadly agree with that apart from one or two parliamentarians and the Prime Minister's wife. However, we can't hold you as a community responsible or accountable because you are basically the victims of us and therefore it's basically our fault. Islamophobia, war in Iraq, or whatever it is. Now, this is lethal in respect of this, that it plays directly into the Muslim refusal to accept any responsibility or blame on their part and to blame their victims instead. And they do this for this reason, that they genuinely believe, they genuinely believe that their culture, their faith is under assault by a West which is designed, which is, at, which is out to destroy them. They genuinely believe that, and therefore they genuinely believe that what are objectively speaking acts of aggression by them, 9-11, 7-7, etc. They genuinely believe these are acts of self-defense. And they genuinely believe that any acts by the West or the free world to defend itself against these objective acts of aggression, uh, America into Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, Israel in, uh, against the Palestinians, those acts are proof that the West is indeed out to destroy them. Now this fundamental untruth has created a kind of dialogue of the demented in which you can't get off the same page. You can't have a dialogue with these people because you're not speaking on the same basis. The problem in Britain is that we don't say this. We don't say, come on guys, this is completely crazy. We're not having this discussion. We're not going to have your double think. We say, yes, we agree because we've got the same double think, this inversion of victim and victimizer. So we deepen the untruth. We act as a kind of echo chamber for the paranoia and the hatred. And this is particularly a problem in Britain because the left, which controls British culture, demonizes the chief victimizers and aggressors of all, America and Israel. So not only is there no challenge to the central Islamist conceit of the big and the little Satan, America and, 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 and Israel, but this is echoed in mainstream British discourse now, where anti-Americanism is at epidemic proportions and Israel is well on the way to being delegitimized. And this acts as an echo chamber, as I've said, for Muslim prejudice, paranoia, and victimization. This is actually brought together, believe it or not, left and right. The left, we all, can, we all know, anti-America, pro-third world, Palestinianism is the fashionable cause of choice, so much is obvious. The right in Britain are what we call uh, Middle Britain, which is a kind of equivalent of your red states, come from a very different perspective. They are isolationists. They think the world is a very dangerous place. If we don't hurt them, they won't hurt us. Why are they hurting us? Because we must have done something terrible to them. What terrible thing have we done to them? We look at the BBC every day. We see these pictures of Palestinian houses being destroyed by Israeli bulldozers look no further, it's all America's fault, it's America which is uh, supporting Israel, uh, uh, Israel is the cause of the problem because it was oppression of the Palestinians, America is supporting Israel, that's why America got bombed on 9-11, we are now supporting America, that's why we're at threat. That is the argument by middle Britain, right-wing Britain, and they meet the left like that. There is not a cigarette paper to choose between the discourse of the right and the left on the issues of Iraq, Israel and America. Britain thinks that Israel is the cause of the problem. That's why we have in Britain now 30s style appeasement, the demonization and delegitimization of Israel and resurgent anti-Jewish hatred. And this is fueling a hatred. It was having two terrible effects. It's acting as a lethal echo chamber for Islamist paranoia and violence, and it's fueling a hatred of America and Israel among the non-Muslim population, which is, I think, causing Britain and indeed increasingly the West to falter in the defense of the free world. Because what we're seeing now is a cultural collapse, a collapse of nerve, a collapse of cultural nerve in Britain and in Europe. And I'm afraid I now see it encroaching in America too. The biggest danger of the West is not Islamism. It's not the Islamic Jihad. That is the obvious threat. But the biggest danger to us is the climate of, a de of defeatism, appeasement, and cultural collapse, which means that we're not able to fight this thing properly. And uh, the, the root of that problem is this cultural relativism, which is effectively deconstructed truth. So in Britain, we have a complete flight from reason and rationality on these issues of Israel, America, and Iraq.
The crucial point to, fit to finish is that this whole thing we can see was a war on terror or a war against terror. Of course that is correct. We've got to uh, discover and stop the terrorist plots. No question about that. But the bigger war that we are facing is a war of ideas. It is ideas that kill. The Islamists are very, very shrewd and intelligent. They have understood something we have find it very difficult to understand. They understand that the people who colonize the world of ideas win this thing. They understand that it's the ideas that are recruiting people to the jihad. These ideas are, which are based on lies uh, and, and paranoia of the kind that I've been telling you about today. And these ideas have to be fought publicly. We have to repudiate it. When we find this double think, as we find in Britain all the time, we're being told, if you tell us the lie again that Islam is a religion of violence, we will kill you. <laughs> and faced with this double think, we don't say, this is insane and this is wrong and we're not having this and you are going to conform to our way of thinking which is basically based on reason, facts and truth, we are silent. We have left the battleground open. We're not being defeated. We're not even fighting because we're not even identifying the ground on which we need to fight. We have to fight these ideas on the battleground of ideas. We have to end this paralysis of doublethink uh, of Islamism. Uh, and above all, we have to sort out in our minds the most difficult thing of all. We tell ourselves Islam is a religion. It is. Islam is one of the three great religions of the world, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. Therefore, we say to ourselves, we can't criticize or take on Islam just as we can't criticize or take on Christianity or Judaism because the state, the public sphere, must keep away from that, otherwise it's oppressive. But we've forgotten one thing that the deal is that the state does keep away from that. Tolerance in a democracy, a liberal Western democracy, is we have freedom of religion, Jews, Christians, Muslims, freedom of religion in the private sphere. The state, the public sphere keeps away. Fine. The quid pro quo is that the religion makes no demands on the public sphere to correspond to its values. Judaism makes no such demands. Uh, Christianity, well, it, it, we are indeed a Christian civilization. But basically, there is a division between church and state, between synagogue and state. There is no division between mosque and state. So we have to say to the Muslim world, if you wish to uh, live in the West, uh, that's fine by us, provided you play by the rules. The rules are religion is private. You are spiritual, you get spiritual sustenance from Islam, fine by us. Not for us to say whether this is true or not. That's fine by us. But as soon as you make demands on us, as soon as you say we want Sharia law, as soon as you say we want you to change your foreign policy, as soon as you say, uh, uh, whatever you say, the wearing of the veil. I'm afraid I think the wearing of the veil is a political act, a political act in the public sphere. This is why it's banned in countries which fear this, T Turkey, Tunisia. In, uh, in, and there are moves now in, in the Netherlands to do the same. We say to them, this is not the deal. Uh, this is not the deal. If you want to live with us, you live by our rules. The trouble is we've not asserted that. We should assert that and then we should see what happens. Thank you.